Hey, welcome. Good to have you here. Hey, thanks, guys, and appreciate it. Sorry for the in and out earlier. <laughs> no, good to have you here. And, and uh, Dr. Stitch, for those of you who don't know, um, just one of the uh, the wisest, but also most innovative uh, doctors you'll meet. He's a, a founder of Wild Health. He's now exited that. He is our medical director at East West Health and just a great collaborative partner. And so you're, you're going to hear more from him on the Go Wellness platform um, because he's got some unique insights and he's a bit of an innovator too. So um, what else did I miss? I mean, uh... <laughs> I think you, you caught the the most of it. We do some tech. I do some tech stuff, and um, I do yeah. a lot of consulting. But yeah, that's a more or less good summary. Um, well, honestly, it's thank you for the intro. It's really an honor to be here. There's nobody who's really pushing the the peptide space like you are. I think you and you know a good friend of mine, Ryan Smith, are like the the two top people that I think about when I need peptide information. So, um, and Ryan's sort of out of biz, out of the business. So you're still fighting the good fight, which is amazing. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. Wow, that's, and that's an honor to be put up there with Ryan Smith, that dude, if I could just talk as fast as him, like I, I'm always like, <laughs> it sounds like you're on two times, Ryan. Can you just slow it down for those of us from Idaho? I'm a redneck, you know, I need it slower. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's a pretty smart dude. Yeah. Well, let me, let me, before we jump into that, I want to talk about methylene blue just a little bit because oh, it's a, yeah. it's like a crazy unique molecule and it, if you are really really big science geek um what you realize really quickly is this pat this molecule has the capacity to both donate and receive electrons so it can act as either antioxidant or it can act as a, an electron carrier so it's really really weird um and when you it, when you look at it, it's, it's it's activated by light, and it actually has three different pathways that it can go through, three different covalent bonds that it can make. And I don't remember the names of the, the different substances, but if you look at like basically the reduced and the oxidized version, there's actually three different ways that it can bond and then transfer those electrons, which is really really cool. Wow. So um, who was it that mentioned Matthew? Um, you mentioned like you didn't feel anything, right? Well, you're not going to feel anything, right? You're not going to feel anything if you have a ton of oxidative stress and acts as an antioxidant. You won't feel a thing. You might notice like the next day you feel better. Um, you're going to notice the, the energy delivery if you're in a more neutral state or if you're in a parasympathetic state, you know, where the body's in that rest and digest or rest and recovery mode. Hmm. It's very because, fascinating. Because all it's doing for, you know, potentially for Matthew is just clearing out some of the interferences is all. And it's not really improved the expression of the cell yet and the signaling. Yeah, totally. Totally. Got it. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. And then to get the real energy benefits from it, we have to expose it to light because that's how you get to those other intermediate states. As you, you add light, it accepts a photon, it kicks the electrons up to a different shell. So basically they're like floating around here and then they float up around here and that allows new bonds to form. Yeah. And you gotta be, you gotta be pretty thoughtful about the light. Like I'm right now I'm in my basement in my little office and you know, I, I probably have somewhere around like, I don't know, 30, 25,000 lumens. Um, it's a pretty small, minuscule amount. When you go outdoors and you're in the sunlight, you've got millions of lumens of light. If you're in front of a red light, you know, you're, you're up around 100,000. Um, and then wow. if you're using some other therapeutic form of therapy, you're even higher. So you got to think about that when you're using this, because if you want to get the energy benefits, then you got to quickly tell your people get outside or get in light. Yeah. When, when we, I, oh, go ahead. Uh, when I was doing my uh, uh, mitochondrial experiment, I did 90 days and stacked all four of these uh, with methylene blue. And I spent two hours. That was my minimum of spending two hours outside. Usually it was an hour in, in the morning as the sun was rising and as the sun was setting. And man, if, if you can get there now, our days are getting shorter. You know, we just had the, the fall equinox, but um, it made such a difference in just my mood, the way I felt. So um, it, it, because that, that light activation is just so powerful for the body and getting outside, we all forget about this like super easy hack, which is 
being outside. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's free. It's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on this book, which is, it's kind of a stupid book in the end, because it's like, what are the things that you can do not to see a doctor? And, you know, it's, it's the obvious stuff. It's like, go outside, eat clean, and, and how the mechanism of all that stuff works, how the body traps stress. But, it, you know, it, it's an obvious one. Yeah, everybody benefits from it. One of the reasons I also like methylene blue is it's an obvious choice and almost everybody benefits from it. Yeah, man. Well, in, in methylene blue, maybe we could touch on this just a little bit, but um, in the use of, of patients who are on SSRIs, um, you know, we have some patients, we start a really low dose, like 10 milligrams, and they seem to do pretty well on that. But if we go higher, it does kind of, you know, they start they start going into a little bit of psychosis, but what, maybe you could give some insights. What's going on there? Do you understand the mechanism of action there? I haven't looked into it much. Yeah, it, the risk is a uh, serotonin syndrome, I believe. And the, it's, you get basically too much serotonin in the synapses. Um, and they, they can go kind of nuts, you can get hyperthermia. It's a pretty rare reaction um, to get you know, the extreme version of that. But it is definitely something to caution. So we, you know, at the places that I work or I advise, we just have protocols where the nurses are screening people. And then, you know, you warn the providers, watch out for that. Yeah. Um, that's about it. There are a lot of people who are on those drugs, obviously, which is a, you know, that's an unfortunate thing in and of themselves because they were never really designed to be on, to stay on indefinitely. Um, that's a whole different can of worms, right. but that's the one major interaction. There's some people who also say um, for similar reasons that anyone who's on stimulants, you have to be cautious about it. I've used methylene blue in a lot of patients. You know, you and I both take care of a lot of executives and a lot of these, you know, like uber high functioning people. And a lot of them are on big doses of stimulants. Adderall is a favorite. Yeah. Uh, Yep, yep, without question. I've not really seen that with Adderall, but I, I will, like, if you're looking through the literature, I'll warn everybody, that is a contraindication, at least theoretically. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any issues either. Um, we we find it's really helpful for down-regulating their use of it, you know, so we can get them on smaller amounts, less frequent mm -hmm. doses, adding in some new PAPs, some acetylcholine, and then... Um, you know, even Tessa Vinson for the, um, I mean, man, that's a, it's a, it's a powerhouse. There's so many cool things. Um, Danny, um, uh, Danny uh, Rasmussen. Have you met Danny yet? I mean, you guys would get along great, but he said, yeah, methylene blue is a C wonder to minister without staining everything. What do you guys use? Yeah, we just, uh, I just like using the liquid Danny and just like spilling it all over a white shirt. <laughs> We, we yeah, use little uh, squirt guns, little syringes, and shoot at each other. <laughs> um, and and uh, I, I, so here's two ways, Danny. One is we uh, there's a, a company. Oh, uh, Dr. Warren. He's here in Utah. He, he he's got a company. NeuroPro is one that we use. I'll, I'll have to find it. Maybe the suppository. <laughs> <laughs> the suppository yeah, i won't tell dr laurence that you don't like some of his suppositories danny but um but the the one thing is um neuropro so they're just tablets you can take um and then um you can do injectable um methylene blue and that's pretty nice like you can do an iv drop yeah kate's showing the tablet there what's the name of that company kate maybe you could plug it in so they can yeah, try it's it's neuro fuel it comes in like a little tube it's super easy and pretty low cost too yeah not less messy by far um and uh, but Jeremy, what have you found? What do you, do you have, uh, have you noticed that patients do better like an IV, like a bigger dose? Do you like to start smaller, uh, more frequent doses? Do you cycle on and cycle off with the methylene blue? Yeah, good questions. You know, that always comes down to what's the, what's the goal? What's the purpose? Um, it's kind of like NAD when you think about it like that. You know, there's, there are folks who because of you know their fatigue and their mitochondrial deficiency and whatever other stressors they have going on, they're going to need their tank filled back up. Yeah. You know, and those folks, you're probably talking about IV um, to kind of get them back to baseline. You know, where they should be if they were taking their 
proper rest, getting proper sleep, you know, eating good, the rainbow of antioxidant foods. Um, and then there's like day-to-day -day therapy. So for maintenance, um, you definitely want to find something that's a convenient form. I like the tablets as well. Um, it's just, it's easy. There's also, there is a, a dropper that's got like Shilajit and methylene blue and high dose iodine in it. It tastes terrible. I cannot recall the name of it off the top of my head, but man, you, you do feel better. Like it's, it's a noticeable difference. It's like proline uh, iodine in there and, and uh, shilajit and, and mm -hmm. methylene blue. I'll have to go look it up. It's yeah. It, it, my brother, my buddy brought it over to the house and left a, a bottle for me. Nice. Wow. But yeah, that's for maintenance. That's what I recommend. And like anything, your body, your body very, very quickly habituates. So a lot of things that I'll counsel, you know, any of my patients on is if you need something today and you're taking it regularly today, well, there's a good chance in two or three months that's going to change. Oh. So methylene blue is no different. If you're taking it on a day to day maintenance, you, what you want to do is you want to do like two or three days on and then at least one day off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think anything with a uh, biology, you know, you got to be sensitive on the inputs because it's a, it's a feedback loop, right? Our biology is like, it gets lazy. It's like, oh, you're, you keep feeding uh, your body, mot C, NAD, anything. I mean, it's, your body's going to be like, well, we don't need to make this anymore. So you're actually, you can do more harm than good in the long run. And that's why, you know, you, you see in our protocols, Dr. Stitch, how it's like most months, everybody's shifting peptides. And so we're working on different pathways. So it sounds like methylene blue is no different. And, um, and, and people like it so much that I have to remind them, I'm like, don't overuse it or you're just not going to experience the benefits. And, and you're going to stain the shit out of your toilet. It's going to be blue forever. So. <laughs> yeah. And there's like a small, small percentage of people who don't. And who it's don't. wild who don't have the blue urine. Is there really? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. And so it, it was, it's the oldest drug. I don't know if you knew this. Like the, the history on it. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and it has been used um, for diagnoses in radiology for years, like forever. And because of that, you know, there were a, a small percentage of people who just never responded. And that means like, you know, they, the urologists would like inject it in the ureters and be looking for like reflux or leak or whatever it is that they're looking for. And not only didn't see the leak, but they didn't see the blue urine. And you're like, well, why? And there's all sorts of proposed mechanisms, um, probably because those people are, are just like very taxed and they, it goes down one of those like rare metabolite pathways that then just gets excreted. Um, uh, wow. It just breaks it down before, I mean, it just absorbs all the color. I mean, that, cause methylene one, blue, uh, I mean, it's a dye for clothing. That's where it was uh, discovered. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the, one of the byproducts or one of the intermediate um, formations of it is I won't say it's colorless. I think it's like a greenish color. It's very subtle, um, and it, it's one that the body doesn't really push down that pathway very often. So that's the working theory. Wow, how fascinating! So, um, so yeah, methylene blue originally was um, malaria. Is that right? I, I, I remember reading a Wikipedia page on it, and it was. I believe it was like they were using it to treat malaria. And then one of the most fascinating treatments that they would do is, is they would use it as a placebo. And they would say, look, Jeremy, um, you know, when you don't know what's going on, it's like, hey, I know you feel like crap, but um, I'm going to give you this very special new medication. And if, if you notice that your urine looks like kind of a green blue color, that's when we know the treatment's working. So just let me know what you see in your urine. And then patients would come back like, Hey, it's working. I can see it in my urine and then they would get better. So, <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to try that with people because that's brilliant. <laughs> just yeah, you give it to your kids when your kids are, uh, you know, having a bad day. Say, Hey, you know, let me just give you this little happy, uh, molecule. <laughs> <laughs> you notice your pee changes color, then you're going to be happy tomorrow and everything's going to be good. <laughs> well, one of the other really nice uses for, um, for methylene blue is, you know, when we're doing like stem cell therapy or any kind of injection, because 
like kind of like any protocol that you're using, one of the goals is that you want to deliver the therapy to the location that you want it to be activated. Mm. All right. So let's sure. just think think through this. Somebody's coming in and like, you know, let's just say it's it's one of our athletes and they've got like a bum knee, they got an MCL sprain or whatever. They want to get back on the field for every week that they're off, they lose money. So their their goal is as quickly as you can, like reduce that time on the bench and get them back in. Yep. So with a lot of these guys, what we'll do is we'll prep the body ahead of time. We'll we'll do a whole bunch of shockwave therapy, break up loculations, basically just open up whatever that joint is um, and increase the oxygen delivery and the nutrient delivery to it. Okay. And then we'll do the injection. And after that, um, while we're doing the injection, we'll, we'll chase it down with some methylene blue. You can also do it beforehand. Then after that, um, I'll use two different things. So I use a really specific 980 nanometer laser. Some people call it a cold laser, but it's not really cold. Um, that turns on ATP in the cells in the specific area that you are targeting. So you know, mm -hmm. you're doing it on knee, you can lift up your knee and just shine it right there. And then right after that, I'll put them in front of a red light or that we have a mortal chamber at a lot of places. and. Um, any kind of light therapy, really, a light bed if you have it. And you want to time that within 20 minutes. After so, the make sure that they're at least in that window, but ideally it would be right after. Yeah, yeah. And the idea here is you put the body in this frame of mind or in this place like it was when you were an infant, right? When you had all of those Hox2 genes and VEGF genes, all those things back on, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that you do that, a lot of these cells respond to phototherapy. Mm. So does methylene blue, right? It mm -hmm. activates it. So you are targeting the area that you really want to target by turning on, you know, the fibroblasts and the chondroblasts and the osteoblasts, the things that kind of turn off when we finish puberty. Wow. And fascinating. It's fascinating stuff. But the difference, though, is fascinating, too, because, you know, you take care of guys who are going to the Caribbean and doing their stem cells, and they're told you got to wait like four to six weeks to get results. And they're doing a bunch of other things as well. So you don't really know what's working, what's not. When, when you activate these things and you use the light therapy and you start stacking it together, I mean, yeah. you've got people like jumping out of there saying, well, like, this is crazy. I'll, yeah. I'll never forget. Um, if we have a minute for a story. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The, the first time that I did this was a soccer player. Um, it was a friend of mine. She was just like this high school phenom and she's like, I want to do everything she can. She's got a bunch of visits and then she, she had a high grade angle sprain. It turned out to be a tear. So we, I like a complete, I think it was calcaneo fibular tear. Um, so we injected it and she just like starts jumping around. So like, well, this is cool. I'm going to try it with some quarterbacks and the, the three quarterbacks from this team had come in. The star is, he, he's like one of the highest paid athletes in the, in the entire country. And he wow. was like, you're not touching me with that stuff. But the other two, the backup guy and the third string were like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. And the third string guy had this lingering hip flexor issue and it had been going on for about a season and a half. And we just did the light therapy on him. He's like, man, I feel better. I was like, well, let's do it all together. So we did it. And he literally was jumping around. He was doing this little like skipping and jumping. And he goes, I just didn't think it was going to work that quickly. I was like, well, this is the way your body's supposed to work. Like literally all we did was give you the ingredients and then you turned it on and you're better. Like it's fascinating how quickly this stuff works. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's um, it's really when you look at the the root of everything, what we've been talking about is mitochondria. And it's like, well, yeah, that's with light therapy, uh, methylene blue, uh, you know, and, and imagine if you put in like, you know, for like a TBI, for example, you know, what if you uh, use like Humanin and SS31 in that protocol? I mean, I, there's just so many cool things that can happen and, and healing uh, from what you're saying, it can be sped up. And that's really what we're looking for. Um, so in, in a safe way. So Patrick, um, 
Good to have you on. Uh, he asked, um, some providers are screening, uh, screening for the uh, G6 PD. So, you know, the hemolytic anemia um, to see if there's any kind of uh, issues with hemolysis when exposed to methylene blue. Is that something that, um, I mean, have you screened for that or do you think it's necessary? Yeah, really good question, Patrick. Um, some people will say you screen everybody. Some people you'll say high risk individuals. Um, high risk individuals are going to be Mediterranean descent and African American descent. They, I think, don't quote me on this. You'll have to do some research, but I believe it's about a six percent that can carry those genes. So it's it's fairly high. Um, you want to use it for IVs, not necessary for oral or you know rectal. You're not getting high enough dose. Um, my threshold is if I'm going above 10, I'm going to screen somebody, or if they're high risk, mm -hmm. I'll screen them. So that's kind of the protocol that we've put in place. Um, <clears throat> we also do a lot of stacks. Like we do this really big, at one of the facilities, like a really big um, NAD. It's like two grams and 40 of, I think it's... Um, two grams? Whatever. Yeah, it's huge. And 10, 10 milligrams of methylene blue. Um, and high dose glutathione. And then you add a little bit of ketamine, um, just an analgesic dose, which has a dual effect of like neuroplasticity and makes it tolerable. And that's like a hard reset, right? These are like hard driving people. They come in, they do a protocol of like three of those. Um, and those people I always screen because they're getting, you're getting so much at one time. Yeah. Um, I want to do that protocol. That's awesome. So how frequently is it? I mean, three treatments, like weeks apart or days apart? Days, you typically want to do it days apart. And the idea is these are people who are like depleted and you're refilling okay. their tank. So I um, I might, it might um, be a little overkill if I did it, but at least I got to try it once. And that, that's awesome. Um, and, and so that's when you would screen. Uh, and, and I appreciate you asking that, Patrick. Um, Caden, Caden needs that one today. He was <laughs> slept in the airport, um, not last night, but the night before. Yeah, I, I need that one. That sounds, that just sounds awesome. Little, <laughs> little bit of ketamine as well as just super high doses there. Yeah, most people yeah. like it. Most people like it a lot. All right, another question Dr. Boland um, asked, um, Dr. Stitch, any thoughts on um, what we could add to uh, IV protocol of stem cells or exosomes uh, for some boys that have, uh, uh, are afflicted with the Duchenne's uh, muscle dystrophy? Oh, and I'm gonna be talking about ACE31 today, Matthew, but yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? We could transition. Uh, methylene blue, it would be a top one for sure that I would think about. Some of the peptides um, that Reagan already mentioned. I'm a big fan of 5-amino M1Q, um, the mod SC2. They, they both work great. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak just for a second because it, it looks like we're, we got a new panelist, so I don't want to take up too much time. But when you think about mitochondria, the mitochondria is designed to take different forms of energy and then translate it into a usable form of energy. So just think about this. Like we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, like you need vitamin D. How does vitamin D get activated? Well, it's through light. So your body runs on a lot of different forms of energy. And, and as opposed to the kind of classical education, right, where you just need movement and food you have to add to that equation light, electricity, and we'll call it like vibration. Um, you know, that's kind of sound and a variety of stimuli. But all those are different forms of energy, right? Light is easy, it's photons that are transferring energy. Yeah. Vibration is, you know, sound or movement. So it's a form of kinetic energy, but it's not a form of kinetic energy that your body can use. Um, <clears throat> And then electricity is kind of the same thing. It's a potential energy, but your body can't use it. You zap somebody with lightning, they die. But if you put them on a PEMF machine, they feel better, right? Yeah. So your mitochondria are, are designed to do this exact thing. They're designed to take a form of energy from the environment. And the, the five batteries are movement, um, calories, light, sound, slash vibration, and electricity. Mm. And turn that into ATP. Yeah. 
So for these folks with Duchenne's, like any one of those things is going to help them. Um, there's a there's actually a guy out who's got a really rare form of muscular dystrophy, uh, dystrophy who's like offered a, I think it's like a $10 million award for a cure. And it's probably not as easy as just doing one thing to fix it, right? It's, you know, we advise these folks, you're gonna have to take a multitude of different modalities to optimize that mitochondrial health, but that is ultimately our goal. Because if that person might have had a lifespan of 40 and you optimize them and you get to 80% of what the average person is, well, you know, 70 is not too bad. It doesn't sound too terrible. Right, yeah. It, man, and that's phenomenal. And then um, Matthew, make sure you stick around and I'll, I'll share some things on the ACE31, which uh, was actually shown to be very effective with uh, these boys with uh, Duchenne's uh, MD. And, and, um, and, and we'll, we'll uh, be back around 11 for that one. But, but in the, before we uh, do that, we're going to talk stem cells and Dr. Stitch, that was phenomenal. I really appreciate you um, taking the time to share your wisdom with us and um, look forward to having many more of these conversations. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll be listening in on the background. So thank you guys. Yeah, awesome. thanks a lot for joining us, Dr. Stitch. Yep. Awesome.